All right. Good evening. Welcome to Turfgrass Epistemology. I'm here. <laughs> Sometimes I think I might not make it. Got kids going to bed. Got to give them hugs and kisses. Good night. Then I got to race back down here. Welcome. I'm Travis Shaddix. It is the evening show for February 28th, 2024. And it's going to be quick, it's going to be fast. We got to move quick because I have a lot of stuff to go over. And um, this is the last show for uh, nitrogen stabilizers for a while. So we're going to sum things up here at the end. But what I want to go over first here is, well, first of all, welcome for everybody's in the, in the chat already. Connecticut Cubonican and Super TA. Good evening, everybody. Andrew Burris, Gray, Gray Fox, Michael Norris, Jeremy Bosch, Chuck Benzing, Robert Osmond. That's a I don't remember that name, but welcome. Maybe I missed it. Birds Lawn Care. A lot of people. The turf nerds here ready to hear about the useless. <laughs> ready to hear about your useless product. Well, it's not useless. It is useful. It's just you're paying for something more than, you know, you don't need to pay for all that extra. I mean, you're still getting something out of it. It's just you, you're you not getting anything out of it more, really, than you would just from straight urea. So, <laughs> okay, let's get started. I got to get going. All right, so. This, we've been going over nitrogen, and uh, the last week or so we've been going over stabilized nitrogen sources. And for the most part, we've found that they contain, uh, most of them will contain two products. A product that will reduce urease inhibition, or uh, inhibit urease conversion and reduce volatilization, and another component that will, at least they claim, will uh, reduce nitrification. And for the most part, there's literature in there that will support those two functions. I'm not going to necessarily argue that. However, when we look at the turf grass response, longevity, color, all these things, we just don't see a lot there. We saw many, many papers. The, the cost paper, Dr. Christensen's paper, saw urea respond for many, many, many weeks. And the difference between stabilized nitrogen sources and urea nitrogen sources in terms of the turf grass response is minimal. If anything, rarely do you see any difference in the actual turf grass response, whether it's color or longevity. And there's been many papers. You can go back and look. There's, I don't know how many papers we've gone over so far. Six, seven, eight papers. And at least two or three of them in there showed a urea, uh, they showed the turf grass response to nitrogen being the same from urea and from stabilized nitrogen sources. Uh, but we haven't really gone too much into the, the other component of denitrification being leaching. So in theory... If the MBPT or the nitrification inhibitor actually is performing as advertised, it will hold the nitrogen in the ammonium form longer and they claim will actually reduce leaching. So to make sure that we're all on the same page and that I'm not just whistling Dixie, we're going to look at some claims right now. So this is a uh, the UMAX stabilized nitrogen flyer that you can go download on the internet. And in here there's going to be a whole host of claims and we're just going to walk through them now that we've gone over the literature a little bit and we're somewhat familiar with what the evidence has is, is shown in the published literature since what 1970 something it's been very consistent it not there's no single paper on which you should base all of your confidence it's a process of building confidence through many publications and we've shown many publications that essentially say the same thing so let's get into this actual claim sheet marketing sheet. They do have a nice little diagram in here that I'm going to use to explain what their claim is. So I'll take that. But in here, if you're not familiar with nitrogen stabilized uh, sources, I've kind of explained it. There's a urease inhibitor and there's a nitrification inhibitor that intend, intended to slow down the conversion of urea and increase its efficient uptake and so forth. And in here, the very first sentence, it says, UMAX stabilized nitrogen fertilizer is a soluble granular, soluble gr granular, should be soluble granule with a dual inhibitor technology that provides protection against all three forms of nitrogen loss, leaching, denitrification, and volatilization. Now, we have covered volatilization and clearly shown that it will reduce volatilization. As I, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the environmental consequences and the environmental risk aside for right now. I'm going to be talking about the pragmatic approach, the turf grass response approach, what we really care about as turf managers. Although, keep in mind, the environmental aspect is important to consider. We don't want to just be throwing stuff out and neglecting that. There is that value. But for right now, I'm going to set that aside for the remainder of the day, really, until we get, well, until we get to leaching. So when it comes to volatilization, it will reduce volatilization. 
I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. It, it, what matters to me is what will that product do to the turf grass that will give me a return on the investment? Okay, that's claim number one. It says it will reduce or provide protection against denitrification. Now, we've shown many publications, at least three, and a little secret here, today's going to be number four, that will show that the denitrification function of the MBPT or the, the other pro component in the urea stabilization, it's questionable at best. So the idea is it's going to hold it in the ammonium form longer. We've shown at least one paper, maybe two, that have shown sometimes it holds in the ammonium form longer. Sometimes urea holds it in the ammonium form longer. Most of the time, there's no difference. Okay, so although I'll give them the, uh, the, the check mark and the green check mark for volatilization, I don't consider the effect on denitrification to be consistent enough to rely upon. But even if it did, do I care? Should you care? Putting environmental consequences aside for right now, should you care? I don't. I care about the turf. What is it going to do to the turf? Okay, now. The next loss is right here, which we have not looked at much, is the leaching component. They claim it will protect against leaching. So that's what we're going to go in today in Dr. with Dr. Gertal's paper. Uh, so it goes in and says, oh, explains, it is a urease-based product with 46-0 analysis containing both urease inhibitor MBPT and DCD and ex to extend the availability of nitrogen in the soil. A completely soluble granule Umax fertilizer is equally effective whether spread dry or dissolved in spray mix. Well, I'll agree with that. It's equally effective one way or the other. I mean, there's, there's, I'm not going not to argue that. It is equally effective. There's, I mean, whether you put it out as a granule or you put it out as a liquid, I'll, I'll agree with that. So here we go on the next one. UMAX stabilized nitrogen fertilizer was specially formulated for the golf, golf market for versatility of applications in 12 weeks of dependable extended nitrogen availability. Okay, UMAX can reduce labor strain, so there's a claim. Avoid turf famine, of that, there's a claim. And efficiently sustain turf health leading to reduced weeds, that's a claim, and disease pressure. A lot of claims in there. A lot of claims, no evidence whatsoever, but I'll give them the 12 weeks. We got to remember, don't be fooled by these red herrings where they say, well, it'll extend the longevity and turf grass response for 12 weeks. Yeah, I know. I, I will show you data right now. You can go back and look. There's probably five papers that have shown that it will have, it'll result in turf grass response for 12 weeks. Don't be, don't be fooled by that because the same turf grass response for 12 weeks will occur from urea without the additive. Okay, very easy to get, to get deceived if you don't have your critical thinking cap on, okay? So over here on the, um, over, oh, hang on, let me make sure I'm, okay, everything looks, okay. So over here on the right, the key benefits are just a summation of all these claims. Dependable performance, performance consisting, reg consistent regardless of soil temperature or weather. I don't see any evidence to support that, but let's say it's true. I mean, you could say the same thing for, for the most part about urea. Dual mode uh, nitrogen protection technology, MBPT and DCD inhibitors. I mean, that's just the component. Okay, that's not a benefit. That's just what it is. Three forms of nitrogen protection. I'll give them volatilization. I'm, I'm not convinced entirely that you're going to consistently see anything from denitrification, and we have not gone over leaching yet. We're going to go over that tonight. But I'll just say that it's not going to be very favorable. <laughs> okay, up to, 12 weeks, up to 12 weeks of plant response. You're going to see that from urea usually anyway. Completely soluble granule, you're going to see that from urea anyway. Quick green up and sustained color, you're going to see that from urea anyway. Virtually eliminates end loss due to mower pickup, you're going to see that from urea anyway. Can be tank mixed, you're going to see that from urea anyway. <laughs> and environmentally responsible. Um, I'll give them some, the benefit on that one. There, Like I said, if you're going to um, can include environmental benefits from reduced gaseous loss, then I'll give them some of that. There's probably enough there to support that claim. Okay. So we're going to go down here to the bottom and we're going to show this little figure just to make sure everybody's on the same page before we get to the leaching study. And this is a figure showing the nit a very generalization of the nitrogen cycle. And what we're going to talk about today is this section right down here when it goes to leaching. So when, when, when the idea behind it is, is that the inclusion of MBPT or a nitrification inhibitor, I'm sorry, DCD, I'm sorry, DCD or a nitri another nitrification inhibitor. It's going to hold 
the nitrogen in the ammonium form longer. It's going to it's going to delay this right here nitrification, which is required to convert ammonium into nitrate. And the reason they claim that that will actually reduce leaching is because the nitrate is negatively charged. And it's more easily leached than a positively charged ion like ammonium. Okay, so this is the claim: reduction in nitrification, holding it in the ammonium form longer, and delaying the conversion of nitrate. So if that's true, what we're going to find tonight is, if this indeed is true, you're going to see larger amounts of nitrate leach from urea because it's not protected. And you're going to see lo lower amounts of nitrate leach whenever the DCD is included, whenever the UMAX is included. That's the, f that's the way it's intended to function. It's delaying nitrate conversion. So theoretically, there should be less nitrate to be able to be leached. So there should be less nitrate leaching. All right. So we're going to get to that, but I want to make sure everybody's on the same page. I'm not even going to get down here. I was going to show something else down here on this figure, but I don't have enough time to do that tonight. So that was, that's the little brief flyer for, um, for UMAX. I'm going to read a very, uh, very brief. I'm going to read a very brief article. And I'm going to come back to this other PDF. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm going to read this article, which is many years ago. This was in golf course industry. If you want to see um, the brilliance of marketing and the fusion of marketing and, and um, not-for-profit not industries, Go read some trade journals because you'll see some, you'll see obviously advertising, which they pay for, but then you'll also see articles oftentimes infused in a way that seems like they're providing information unbiasedly, but it's infused with um, marketing, <laughs> basically. So we're going to read this article from Golf Course Industry from 2016. So I'm sure these people are long gone from these locations by now. And, you know, who knows where they are now. It's sort of irrelevant. I, the, the, the superintendent in here, I believe it's superintendent here is I'm not, there's no knock on him or anything. He's going to say that he saw these certain things and it's fine. But I want to notice, I want you to notice how the, the writer infuses some advertising into this article. So it's by John Torciello. I don't know, John. And, it's, and the title is Impressive Results. Superintendent switched to enhanced efficiency fertilizers to address a number of economic problems he was having at the Country Club of the Rockies. Okay. Being a keen eyed superintendent, Kevin Ross noticed how enhanced efficiency fertilizers were produced, were producing healthy, dense turf in the rough areas at the Country Club at the Rockies, located about six miles outside Vail, Colorado. So he's, he wisely deduced that this technology can do the same for his fairways. So just to keep in mind, regardless of what I show in the published literature or what a researcher showed or whatever, I can't deny someone's observation. I'm not in their mind. I'm not out there on the golf course with them. I'm not, I'm not there. So I'm not here to refute any observation they may or didn't make. make. I mean, I don't know what they saw or didn't say or see, didn't saw or didn't see. Um, so I'm not here to say he didn't see that or saw that, you know, he, if he saw it, he saw it. Um, but when we, when we want to make decisions, evidence-based decisions and best management practices, basing them on observations is basing them on someone's opinion. And regardless of the number of observations, you could have a hundred observations and they're not as valuable as one published piece of evidence. Remember the hierarchy of evidence. There's a lot of noise in the bottom and it's only when we start moving up that pyramid into the, into the literature, into the referee papers, where we start to have confidence in the information. All the information down below could be true, could not be true. It's just opinions. It's just observations. And we can't really base a whole lot of, off of that level of information. We continue. Whoops, that's not the right one. We continue. I was looking for a new product because I wasn't totally happy with my previous fertilizer program on the fairways, said Ross, who, was, who has been a superintendent at the Country Club of the Rockies for 22 years. I thought there has to be something better. And he found out there was. I had used the two Coke turf ornamental products, Uflex and Umax in the rough, in some other areas of the course and really liked the performance, he said. I thought maybe this could be something that would, be, would also work in the fairways. The granular fertilizer I was using wasn't breaking down and disappearing very well. 
it was sticking on mowers and mower baskets. We pick up our clippings on fairways and on golfer shoes. UMAC stabilized nitrogen fertilizers. And so that was what his observation was. So that was basically a superintendent saying, this is what I saw. This is the challenge I was trying to overcome, which is all fine. Okay, now watch what happens in the article. UMAC stabilized nitrogen fertilizer, which Ross has been using on fairways for about five years, needs only a little bit of water to dissolve into the profile. So does urea. UMAX fertilizers provided prote provides protection against all three forms of nitrogen loss, leaching, denitrification, and volatilization. Now, where did we just read that? In their marketing flyer. I don't have a problem with the marketing of all products, but when you're writing it into an article, you're infusing it into an article, it's very clever how they go from someone's observation, from a superintendent who's well-respected, what they're, what they're trying to accomplish, and they infuse in this marketing line in here. It's very clever how they do that. Don't be fooled. It is a urea-based product with a 46O analysis containing both urease and nitrification inhibitors. Unlike many single inhibitor products on the market, the addition of a nitrification inhibitor and UMAX fertilizers reduce the chance of leaching and denitrification, which are big concerns in the golf industry. Just like the flyer we just read. <laughs> okay, This second inhibitor also retains nitrogen as ammonium, which can be held on soil cattle exchange sites, extending the window of nitrogen availability. We have no evidence to indicate that's true, by the way. Okay, We haven't shown anything. They haven't shown us anything. Products with urease inhibitors alone do not include this benefit. A completely soluble granule, UMAX fertilizer is equally effective whether spread dry or dissolved in a spray tank. Dissolved UMAX fertilizers can also be tank mixed with many crop protection chemicals. So that's just one massive paragraph in, an, in a golf, a respected golf uh, magazine. That is just a, just a advertising. That's all it is. The whole paragraph is just advertising. It has nothing to do with what this particular superintendent is is trying to accomplish i'm more interested in what he's doing what is he experiencing what is he seeing what's he you know what's he trying to you know how's he trying to become more efficient with his programs and they have this paragraph in here which is nothing more than just an advertising you can see this on the side of the of the magazine you got to be real careful with this stuff Uflex stabilized nitrogen fertilizer is especially formulated for no we changed from umax to uflex is especially formulated for the professional lawn care and landscape markets this unique product also helps to protect against all three forms of nitrogen loss, leaching the nitrification of the same thing, allowing time for nitrogen to move into the root zone and stay there longer. As a result, there is immediate green up following by sustain, swallowed by sustained turf grass color for up to eight weeks. Same thing as from urea. You're going to get that from urea, but you're going to pay twice as much. Now, if you go, if you Google right now, price of UMAX or cost of UMAX, it's, you're gonna, it's going to be hard to find on the internet because a lot of times they don't even want to do the price, not just from UMEX, but from Urea or whatever. They don't like to quote the price. But you'll find one or two sites on there. And I've, I did this this morning. The price of UMAX was, I wrote it down. What did I do with it? I, I want to say the price of UMAX was around $90 for a 50-pound bag, $85 to $90 for a 50-pound bag. And from that same vendor, the price of Urea 4600, the granular, they're both as, as granules, not the spray grade. Uh, the price of that was forty two or forty three dollars a bag. I can't remember. So, but it was I remember it was roughly half. So the the price of urea was half the price of U Umax, which is what we've been saying all along for the last week or two is that you're paying double for Umax than from urea. Okay, it's a lot more money. It's not five percent more, ten percent more. It's usually double. Okay. And um, I'm not going to continue with this this article. I just wanted to show that as as a, as a clever way that some of these um, some of these businesses like to weave in marketing into what would be otherwise be to me a very interesting article. I want to know what what uh, what Kevin Ross is doing over there. I'd like to know what he was, you know, trying to accomplish and what, whether he did accomplish it or did accomplish it. I don't know what he did, you know, and, and, but they weave in this massive amount of marketing and you just get bombarded with it, even in an article that's supposed to be about like a practical, a practitioner, you know, what is he doing? Oh, we're having a problem. We tried this. This is what we found. Even in those things where they're somewhat interesting to me, they weave in all this marketing BS. And, um, so be aware of that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, don't let your guard down, okay? And this article is a little bit longer, and I don't have time to go into the whole thing, but I wanted to go over that as a means to, uh, again, reinforce this concept that it, U, U Max and U Flex, U Max and U Flex, 
are nitrogen stabilizers, the nitrogen stabilizer products are being marketed as environmentally sound by means of reducing nitrogen leaching. Now, what does the evidence say? That's what we're here tonight to look at. So what we're going to go into the, the article, and I may or may not get back to this other PDF. I have another PDF, but honestly, I don't think I'm going to have time to get to it. Um, okay, so we're going to, I'm just checking the chat to see if there's anything I'm missing. Western Mass Turf says, I'm fully focused on this show now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Can you cover armament? potassium acetate at some point in the future i have no idea what armament is matt western mass turf i know what potassium acetate is but you'll have to give me a little bit more information send me an email western mass or you know send me a link or put it in well it's better to send me on an email because you put it in the chat i'm going to forget about it um Yeah, Garden Earth got caught one live. Okay, good. All right, so it looks like everything is good in chat. Okay, let's get let's get going. This is a really important article. This is by a really uh, by a really important woman, and um, we're going to do our best to do it justice. I wanted to wait on this article because I wanted I wanted to have Beth come on and actually do it because I don't want to screw it up. <laughs> okay, that's basically what it comes down to. I don't want to mess up her article, and um, I'm afraid I might mess it up. So, wish me luck. I hope I don't mess it up. I hope I do it justice. Uh, this is a really important article. It has to do with nitrogen. Well, the title is Nitrogen Ammonium and Urea, Urea Leaching in Hybrid Bermuda Grass as Affected by Nitrogen Source. There was a question the other day or a comment the other day about going over warm season grasses. So here's another warm season grass paper. This is by Dr. Gertal and, and J.A. Howe. I don't know J.A. Uh, I'm not sure if he or she is, who she, he or she is. Um, but this was published in Crop no, Agronomy Journal in 2012 so you can go to agronomy.org right now you can search you know just type this name this title in and you'll find the article and you can read the abstract for free and get a basic idea of what what she did and what she found we're going to get into it i'm going to read through the the green parts primarily and then she does a really good job in, in of showing the results and i'm going to have a little anecdote when i get to the results <laughs> okay when, when nitrogen sources were evaluated in a leaching study, slow-release nitrogen sources reduced nitrate nitrogen leaching from turfgrass systems. Previous nitrogen source leaching research often included urea formaldehyde, sulfur-coated urea, or melorganite, or isobutylidine diurea, with studies evaluating those slow-release sources over 50 to 180 days. In turf grasses fertilized with slow-release nitrogen sources, nitrate in leaching, or nitrate in and leachate was often significantly reduced compared to turf fertilized with soluble sources such as ammonium nitrate or urea. For example, fertilization with IBDU instead of urea reduced nitrate in leaching in soils from 32 to 23%. Now we've been talking about, uh, we've been, oh, I'm sorry, I had it the wrong way. You gotta, uh, I can't keep up with all this stuff. Um, we've been talking about urea and the um, competitiveness that other nitrogen sources have with urea is very limited. It doesn't have, the other slow release nitrogen sources or even soluble nitrogen sources at least the ones that are available today, um, don't really compete well with urea agronomically, and they d definitely don't compete well with urea economically. However, I've been saying multiple times is that there is value to using slow-release materials in some instances, i.e. if you don't know what you're doing, if you're new, if you have a new employee who doesn't know what he or she's doing, they don't know how to spread properly, they don't know how to weigh the bag properly, they don't know how to measure the property properly. If they don't know what they're doing, then urea is a very sensitive product. You're going to, if you apply too much, or you you have a greater risk of causing problems, not only to the turf but the, to the environment. When you're using the slow release materials, they're more expensive, but they have a little bit more buffer to them. Your risk is a little bit lower. You, your your fudge factor, if you will, isn't quite so so high. You have a little bit more room for error, I should say, in the slow release materials. Okay, and it's consistent in the literature that if um, if the water is not very precisely controlled, the sl then the slow release materials generally will re result in less leaching of nitrate. Okay, that's pretty consistent literature then compared to urea. And that's what she's saying right here. Okay. Now, I would argue that if you know what you're doing and you're very careful with the amount you're applying and you control the water, then urea is fine. 
You're not really going to have much environmental concern as long as you can control that. But if you can't and you, you don't have any control of the water at all, then you're, in a, you're moving your risk up, up higher and higher by using soluble end sources rather than slow release end sources. But it doesn't mean there's a problem. I'm just, I don't want to act like there's a problem. There's not. But just keep that in mind. There is value to these slow release materials in that regard. So as polymer coated ureas and their variants were introduced to the turfgrass market, several studies examined the ability of these newer generation slow release nitrogen sources to reduce nitrogen leaching losses. And she goes through a whole series of uh, literature here explaining what other people have done and showing the results of what other researchers have, have published on the differences between leaching of soluble end sources versus other slow release nitrogen sources like polymer coats. Okay. I'm not going to go into all that. I'm happy to go into all these articles individually. This particular Gallard and Cop paper is extremely important. This one right here. That's a very, very, well, she cites it up here too. And the Petrovic 2004 paper is really important too. So we may end up eventually, I'm sure I'll eventually go into all these papers, but I'm not going to go into them tonight. The Reich and Ellis paper is good. Brown 77 is good. Yeah, all these are really good papers. Yeah, so the Morton 88 paper. Yeah, all these Snyder 84 paper. This is a moisture sensor paper. Yeah, all these are really good papers. I'm going to have to come back to these papers. When I, get, when I get more into the environmental issue, I'll come back to these papers. Okay. General recommendations to limit nutrient leaching in turfed soils include avoid over-application of nitrogen fertilizers, consider use of slow-release nitrogen sources or split applications of soluble in sources, and prevent excessive irrigation. That's pretty standard. Either use slow-release to avoid leaching, split, or split the soluble into lower applications but do them more frequently, or control the water. All those are going to result in very, very limited amount of nutrient uh, leaching, very, very minimal environmental impact. But if you apply high rates of soluble in, so in, say, you know, one or two pounds of soluble in, and you don't control the water, you know, that's where things start to get messed up. That's one of the reasons I'm saying if your if your applicators or your your you know uh, guys spreading the fertilizer in your fairway, if you're if you if you're you know subbing that out or whatever, and they're not you know, very precise with it and you're not controlling the water, then you're going to potentially run into problems. Missing from the current literature are studies that included newer polymer coated urea nitrogen fertilizers or urea added with nitrification inhibitors. Nitrogen fertilizers with nitrification inhibitors are promoted for their ability to reduce nitrogen loss via leaching. Remember what see, it looks like she wrote. <laughs> I love Beth. You see, the way she words it is very clever. Nitrogen fertilizers with nitrification inhibitors are promoted. In other words, she's not saying they do it. She's saying that they say it does it. <laughs> They're promoted like that. That's true. They are promoted that way, which is what I just showed you. I just showed you an, a flyer, and I'm going to show you a PDF of I have time at the end, where it has all these listed out, and, it, and they promote this. They say that it actually does reduce nitrogen leaching. And like I said, I just showed you all that stuff. So they promote says, uh, reduced nitrogen loss via leaching, yet limited published information is available. Additional studies of leaching from turf surfaces is predominantly conducted on sandy or sandy-based root zones, and soil textures that contain a higher percentage of silt or clay are less frequently evaluated, which I would say is definitely true. It's not easy to do a lot of leaching work with clays. You have to be extremely patient and very accurate because that water just doesn't really want to move through those columns very much. So you have to really kind of know what you're doing if you start messing with leaching through clays. It can happen, but hi historically in the literature, you don't see a lot of that. One, because generally leaching tends to be a little lower in clays, but two, it's not easy to do, to be frank. Thus, the objective of this research project was to evaluate nitrate in, ammonium in, and urea in, and leachate from a hybrid Bermuda grass turf as affected by soil type and end source, including an end source containing a nitrification inhibitor. So here we go. So that this is UMAX. <laughs> so all those claims we just went over where they showed, you know, a flyer, which is fine. It's their flyer. And then it showed a, a journal, I mean, a, you know, a, a, you know, a periodical. And then in the periodical, it was basically a marketing, she marketing sheet saying it reduces leaching, all these things. So we're going to find out. The two year experiment was conducted at Auburn University Turcrest Research located at Auburn, Alabama, in Auburn, Alabama. Three sets of leachate collecting, collection chambers, each set consisting of 16 individual small lysimeters. For those of you who don't know what a lysimeter is, a lysimeter is any contraption, really, that's designed to contain the movement of water downward. It can be made of many different things. Usually it's a column or a PVC column. 
but it can be a tub, it can be a plastic container, or it can be a stainless steel tank, anything that can uh, hold the soil and, and allow movement of water through it and then collect it at the bottom is a, is a lysimeter. 16 individual small lysimeters were used for this experiment. Okay. In mid-May 2008, lysimeters were sodded with Tifway hybrid grass harvested from the turf grass unit. So we're dealing with 419, Tifway 419 guys in Auburn, Alabama. Harvested sod depth was approximately one inch with Marvin loamy sand as the underlying soil. Average thatch depth in the sod at the harvest was around one inch. The sod was allowed to grow for six weeks until the experiment initiated in July 2008. Fertilizer sources were one, urea, Umax, which was agritane. Where's three? Oh, three was polyon 43. And four was an unfertilized control. Umax is a stabilized nitrogen fertilizer containing urea, dicyandiamide, and n butyl thiophosphoric trimide, which is you know, DCD and TPT. That's the way they'll be denoted. Polyon is a polymer coated urea containing a pa patented reactive layer coating technology. Fertilizers were hand applied with a shaker jar in a checkerboard fashion to the top of each lysimeter at a rate of pound and a half. Oh, that's good. She even put it in English units, pound and a half and lightly watered uh, 0.5 centimeters. So that would be whatever that is, a tenth of, or 2.2 .2 inches, I guess, or 0.3 inch. I don't know what that is in, in inches, 0.3 inches, I guess. After application, fertilizers were applied in July 2008 and July in 2009. Now, if you remember from this morning's paper, we talked about temperature, the effect of temperature on these denitrification and urease inhibitors. And it showed that temperature does have an impact. The higher the temperature goes, the more volatilization occurs. And these products like this, where it contains a, we're not looking at the volatilization in the study, but a product like this that is, uh, contains a urease inhibitor applied in July in Auburn, Alabama, where it's really hot, would likely reduce the volatile, volatile loss of urea that would occur at those higher temperatures. So keeping more of it in the soil basically is where I'm going with that. Okay, let's get to the results. So real quick, where we're at, oh, let's say where we're at. We are in Auburn, Alabama with Tifway 419 Bermuda grass that was sawed, that was applied to the top of lysimeters in the field. Okay. We, we have urea. We have Umax. Is it Umax? What'd you say? Umax? Yeah. We have urea. We have Umax. We have polyon 43 and we have an unfertilized control. What we're going to, what she's going to do is she is going to measure leachate through the bottom of these lysimeters. She's going to measure ammonium. She's going to measure urea and she's going to measure nitrate nitrogen. And she's also going to, oh, here it is. Let me get this back on the screen. She's also going to measure the ammonium and nitrate in the soil. And so she took a, a zero to, to three inch deep soil sample collected and analyzed soil extractable two molar KCL for nitrate and ammonium. That's a very standard uh, soil lab extraction procedure for me measuring ammonium and nitrate is a two molar KCL. All soil extracts and water samples were analyzed using standard colometric technique. Okay, you don't need to worry about that. So basically at the end, she took a soil, can she took a soil sample and then, then she, she measured the ammonium and the nitrate in the soil. Then she measured the ammonium and nitrate and urea moving through the soil. That's basically what we're going to be looking at here, okay? Okay, now the results. There were few sampling days in which the addition of any fertilizer source significantly increased nitrate in leaching, nitrate in concentrations in leachate above that measured in the control. Furthermore, there were few differences in nitrate in, in leachate due to in source in clay soil during 2008. Except, oh, oh, I forgot to mention, we're going to have three different soils. There's a sandy, uh, there's a sandy soil, a, a sandy loam soil and a clay soil. So we're dealing with three different soils here. Okay. Should have mentioned that. Dang it. I missed that. Sorry guys. I thought I had that in highlighted, but I may have missed it. How did I miss that? Well, you'll, well, you'll see it in the, in the, in the tables. So we're, she's applying all this in the three different, so in three different soils. There were a few differences in nitrate in and leachate due to in-source in the clay soil during 2008. Exceptions to this occurred in 2008 at 21 and 28 days. I'm going to show you this after fertilization. 
when Bermuda grass fertilized with Umax had greater nitrate in and leachate, and also at 28 and 63 days in 2009. Okay. <laughs> Did anybody catch that? Let me read it again to see if anybody catches this. Furthermore, there were, there were few differences in nitrate and leachate due to insource in the clay soil. The exceptions to this occurred in 2008 at 21 and 28 days after fertilization when Bermuda grass fertilized with Umax had greater nitrate in and leachate and also at 23 or 28 and 63 days in 2009. <laughs> Remember, Umax is supposed to be holding the nitrogen in the ammonium form. It's supposed to be delaying the conversion from ammonium into nitrate. So you should have less nitrate in the leachate for you when you're using Umax. And what she's saying is, Bermuda grass fertilized with Umax had greater nitrogen, nit nitrate, nit nitrogen in leachate in these, those particular times I just noted. <laughs> Love it. There's some more results here. I'm not going to go into a whole lot in the text. I'm going to show you in the figures. The Umax fertilizer is stabilized urea, which contains both nitrification, DCD, and volatilization, TPT inhibitors. Application of a fertilizer with a nitrification inhibitor should, hypothetically, have re resulted in less nitrate in leaching than the treatments receiving soluble urea. I may have to pause this because I'm going to start laughing so hard. My, no <laughs> my nose is... Hang on a second. Hang on. Ugh. Whenever stuff like this happens, I have like some sort of tick or something where I just... I get so giddy when I'm reading these results. What kind of person gets giddy reading research results? I mean, come on. It's great. When it, so she just said, I mean, it should have done the opposite. And they found, you know, <laughs> this is what happened. When examined at weekly or more frequent collection intervals, there were two events with a significant reduction in the concentration of nitrate and leach when a nitrification inhibitor was added to urea. Umax compared to urea. And I'm going to show that in the clay or loamy sand soils. I'm going to show you all this stuff. Okay, guys. Both events occurred in 2009. One occurred in the loamy sand soil at 30 days after fertilization and the other in the clay soil at 14 days after fertilization. I'm going to get to the graphs. I'm going to show you this. I've already highlighted it in the graph, so I'm not going to miss it. When Umax was applied to the sand soil, there were five sampling dates in which the concentration of nitrate in, in leachate was reduced in that treatment as compared to urea. So in the sand soil, there was a little bit of evidence that nitrogen, nitrate, nitrogen was reduced compared to urea. But hold on, <laughs> don't, don't get too excited yet, okay? I'm going to show you that. In 2008, it, at 21, 28, and 33 days after fertilization, in 2009 at 14, 49, and 56 days after fertilization, nitrate in concentrations in leachate from sand soils was less from Umax treated plots than from urea treated plots, okay? I'm going to get to that. <laughs> Already highlighted it. Okay, here we go, figure one. So this is what she's talking about. Okay, so what I've done here on these figure, what, what we're looking at for those people who are listening, if I can, I can't get it all on the screen all at one shot, but I'm gonna try, yeah, try my best here. Okay, on the, on, we're looking at a one figure that has six equal size panels. On the X axis, we have days after fertilization going from zero to 70, and then from zero to 84, zero to 70 in 2008, and then zero to, 70, zero to 84 in 2009, okay? The top two panels are clay, the two clay, the one clay soil in 2008, 2009, and then the loamy sand, 2008, 2009, and the sand in 2008, 2009. And then on the, on the y-axis, we have nitrate in and leachate. Okay? So, I've highlighted in green what she was talking about. She was talking about in the clay, 14 days after, when you're looking at the, the legends here, guys. So, the, 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 the dark triangle is Umax and the open triangle is Urea. In here, in the clay in 2009 at 14 days, we see that the, the Umax nitrate nitrogen as a result of Umax was reduced. Here's, here it is here at uh, 10 or 20 uh, parts per million, whatever this is. And the urea is up here close to 40 or 50 at 14 days after. In the loamy sand at 28 days after, you see it here. Here's the, um, here's the urea at Three, three parts per million and the Umax was at one part per million. They're showing those, those are different. Okay. And then you get down here in the sand. Now we're dealing with a much so, a lighter soil. We don't have the heavy soils from the loamy sand or the clay. For the sand, we actually do see some reductions in nitrate leaching 
from Umax compared to urea. And I've highlighted these in green at 21, 28, 35 days, just like she said. And you'll see this is what this is what she's talking about. This reduction here from the open triangle to the dark triangle from about 20 parts per million down to 15 parts per million. And then there's they changed in the concentrations based upon the day. But this is what she's talking about. If you want to go back and read this, this is how to how to decipher this. This open triangle here going at 56 days after down from 1.2 to 0.2, whatever. Okay. But okay. The opposite also happens. So whenever the, so what she's saying, is, what she said is, it, there's rarely any differences, but there was an occasion where the UMAX did result in a reduction in nitrate leaching. In the clay, it was at one day. The loamy sand, it was at this one day, 28. And then in the sand, it actually occurred frequently. You know, well, it looks like it occurred maybe five to, three times in one year and three times in the other year out of maybe, well, how many did she do here? She did. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It looks like maybe about twelve samplings, around twelve samplings in each year, and in each year, three of those twelve samplings, you there was a reduction in nitrate and leaching. Okay. However, okay, <laughs> the opposite occurred too. So in the clay in two thousand eight, we saw greater nitrate leaching. The 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 closed triangle. And here's the open triangle down here. Look at all the open, the closed triangles. And it's 14 days after, 28 days after, 21 days after, 28, 35 days after, where the closed triangle is actually leaching more nitrate. And that's what she was saying in the first one, in, the, in, the, in this first paragraph here, where the exceptions occurred in 2008, 21 and 28 days, where the Bermuda-Gas fertilizer of the UMAX had greater nitrate and leaching. So and you see that here too, where in 2009, where you see at 28 days, you see greater nitrate and leaching here, greater nitrate and leaching here. Going from six six from Umax down to you know, when you just use urea, it was only two or three. Okay, so you're buying, you're buying, and then this, you'll see all the red marks here. I'm from the loamy sand as well. You'll see a couple here where we're going from ten. Or we're, let's say if you just use urea, it was six parts per million. If you use Umax, it was closer to nine at 21 days after in the loamy sand in 2008. And you can go through there and see. So the the point is, is that you you can the the, the manufacturer or the distributor can use data. And I'm not saying they would use these data, but they can use data and say, yes, we did see a reduction. That's right. We did see a reduction. And Dr. Gertal says, yes, they, they, there was a reduction on these dates. That's true. But when you're dealing with someone who's unbiased, or as best as we can as a scientist, we look at all the data. We don't cherry pick one thing out. And when you look at all the data, you see points where it was nitrate and leaching was greater from UMAX and you see points where nitrate and leaching was less from UMAX and the majority of the time there was no difference and I mean I'm, I sound like a broken record I mean how many times have I said this about these products and it didn't have anything to do with that it has to do with even go back to the thatch products most of the time nothing happens go back to the 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 what was I covering before this I don't even remember I mean, there's so many times where I said most of the time nothing happens occasionally you'll see a benefit occasionally you won't see a benefit most of the time, nothing happens. And even on this study, you see the same result. Okay. But keep in mind, if they said, if the manufacturer distributor said, well, we have evidence to show that it does reduce nitrate and leaching, I would say, yes, we have evidence too. It's right here. Look, I'm looking at it right now. This right here. Right here. It's showing it's reducing in the sand. It's showing right here. It's reducing in this clay. Yes. Or right here. Reducing in this clay. But we're also showing evidence where it's increasing. And we're also showing probably more than half the time, nothing happens. And none of this would even be a conversation. It wouldn't even be important at all if it wasn't twice as expensive as urea. If it was 5% more, then maybe you go, well, okay, maybe five or six times out of 100, I'll get a reduction in nitrate and leaching. I'm only paying 5% more, big deal. I mean, you, you could make that argument. You're paying double, guys and gals. That's why we're talking about it double for this and you're not getting much return on investment at all if anything you're probably not yeah you're probably not getting anything honestly i mean if if you hit if you hit the numbers just right meaning if you had no clue what you're doing if you had no care for how you applied it or the ph of the soil or the water you applied or the temperature you're applying it at or in, in nothing you had no care at all and you just went out and threw this stuff out, 
there may be a, a night, just a perfect storm of events occur where the gaseous loss would have just gone through the roof without it. And with a product like a nitrogen stabilizer, it's reduced. It's certainly possible that a scenario such as that could occur. Okay. But we just don't see it, right? We just, you know, as long as you follow best management practices, we just don't see the value in these nitrogen stabilizers. And it's time after time. And now we're seeing even in leaching, we don't see it. This was concentration. Now let's get into the, 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 um, the cumulative. In 2009, there was a greater cumulative quantity of nitrate, nitrogen, leachate in the clay soil from Bermuda grass fertilized with UMAX. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, it's unbelievable. As compared to any other treatment, in both years, total cumulative nitrate in leached from loamy sand that had been fertilized with polyon was lower than that measured in UMAX or urea fertilized treatment. So that's pretty consistent too. Polymer coated urea is generally, any slow release generally will reduce leaching compared to solubles. But read this last part. I like the way she threw this in there. See, I, I wish she was here. I, I, I gotta, gotta get her on here. I may have to go over this article again. Read this again. So uh, nitrate leaching, for, uh, in both years, total cumulative nitrate and leached from loamy sand had, that had been fertilized with polyon was lower than that measured in UMAX or urea fertilized treatments. And those two treatments had equal cumulative amounts of nitrate and leachate. And leachate. <laughs> like, you see how she kind of threw that in there? I don't wonder if she did that on purpose. In other words, she, she said, she didn't really have to kind of throw that in there, but I like the fact that she did. The UMAX and urea had equal cumulative amounts of nitrate and leachate. She just kind of slid that in there. To me, I'm reading into that going, I know what you're saying. <laughs> it shouldn't be that way. The, you, the UMAX, which you pay double for, which they claim reduces nitrate leaching, should be less than urea. It should be. But she's saying, nope, they're the same. <laughs> with with this nitrate and leaching, cumulative nitrate and leaching, polyon greatly reduced it, but not the urease inhibitor, not the or not the nitrification inhibitor. Let's continue. For Bermuda grass grown in in sand soil in two thousand eight two thousand nine, nitrate and leach and leachate was equal in plots receiving UMAX or urea. <laughs> so she said it again. In two thousand eight, nitrate in was equal in sand plots that was that were fertilized oh, that were unfertilized or fertilized with polyon. So the, the polymer coat is is resulting in basically background levels. In 2009, there was greater total nitrate and leached from polyon fertilized sand plots than in the sand control, but this difference only became significant as a sampling week 11 and 12. In 2009, cumulative nitrate in leached from sand plots was significantly affected by fertilizer source in this fall in the following order. Urea was greater than polymer coated urea, which was equal to UMAX, which was greater than the control in 2009 from the sand plots. What she's talking about is this chart right here. We're in 2009, 2009, yeah. And she's talking about this panel right here where the cumulative, they actually did show a urea resulted in a greater cumulative nitrate in leaching in 2009 in the sand. But not in the clay, not in the loamy sand, and not in 2008 in the sand. Okay? In clay soil, the total mass of ammonium in, in leachate was unaffected by nitrogen source with an average cumulative ammonium nitrogen of 26 milligrams of ammonium in in 2008 and 13 milligrams of ammonium in, in 2009. In the loamy sand treatment in 2008, Bermuda grass fertilized with urea had a greater cumulative mass of ammonium in leachate as compared to any other nitrogen or, or the unfertilized treatment. Average of 21 milligrams of nitrogen, okay. In 2009, a similar response was observed, observed, except it was the UMAX treatment that showed a slightly higher increase in mass of ammonium nitrogen in leachate. So, so let me explain what's going on here. She's talking about, in this case, the ammonium leaching from the loamy sand. And she said in the first year, 2008, more ammonium was leached from the urea, okay? Which you could argue, you know, one way or the other. I mean, you could say, well, the urea converted more of, it to, of the ammonium or, you know, less of the ammonium was retained in the soil. You could argue that one way or the other. But what you can't argue 
is that one year urea resulted in most ammonium nitrate in leaching, and then the next year it was the Umax that resulted in the most ammonium in leaching. So there's not there wasn't any consistency with the Umax. The product we're paying double for. Okay. Okay, here we go. I'm coming down to the end here. In 2008, the total mass of urea in leachate was greater when the Bermuda grass was fertilized with Umax as compared to Bermuda grass fertilized with urea. This is like the third time she said this in here. Well, something similar to that in here. This same effect was also observed in 2009, but the total difference was not statistically significant at the end of 12 weeks. So she said it right here. That's the reason it's in orange. So I highlighted it in orange for a reason. The total mass of urea in leachate was greater using a product that claims to reduce it than the product that is just untreated. I mean, I don't know what else we got to do. I mean, we, we have claims all over the place, and I've said many, many times, there's no reason to believe it. There's no reason to not believe it. You got to stay neutral on it. But this is, until, until evidence comes up, this, but this is just, I'm just showing this one leachate paper. There's numerous papers like this. And there's numerous papers about the, there's lack of differences between these expensive nit nitrogen stabilizers and urea when it comes to the turf grass response. There's numerous papers over and over and over. It's the same thing, whether it's in Iowa, whether it's in Florida, whether it's in Alabama, whether it's in New York, it's the same thing over and over where we just don't see any consistent, dependable predictable response or value by using these nitrogen stabilizers even in leaching okay the highest amount of in collected as urea represented 1.2 percent of the total in applied the reason i highlighted that is because i want to ma make sure we're clear here is that we're talking about a very small amount of nitrogen that leached relative to what was applied we're dealing with turf grass people turf grass is an an, a, a massive, massive absorber, absorber, absorber <laughs> of really anything that's soluble in the water. It will take it up and it just sucks it up like a sponge. Now, I think if people actually, actually, actually did some work on this, and even if it was in high school, just a basic rudimentary leaching study, and, and tried to get nitrogen to leach through these columns. I think they'd have a greater appreciation for how difficult that is in many cases with healthy turf grass. Healthy, well-established turf grass is not that easy to get nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium to move through that stuff. I mean, and I think people don't appreciate that because they haven't actually gone out and failed. You tried it and it didn't work because nothing leached through the bottom. You try it again. You try it again. You got to do some really crazy things. You got to get the water way up out of BMP ranges to get that movement of water down. You've got to get high levels of soluble nitrogen to get enough to where it moves through the soil profile to be able to detect it. Turf grass is an amazing organism. I'm telling you, it's not easy to leach through. And I wanted to highlight that point because I'm talking about nitrogen leaching. I'm talking about ammonium leaching. Or, you know, she's talking about urea leaching, all these things. But let's keep things in perspective. We're only talking about about 1.2% of what was applied here. Okay. Very, very little. Let's continue. The last part, and I got to move quick because I, I want to get to the last part, which is even more fun <laughs> because she actually, like she said, she measured the ammonium and nitrate in the soil too. Don't forget the actual, what was remaining in the soil. So surely if the product is going to retain more ammonium than nitrate, it's going to, it's going to retard the movement of ammonium to nitrate. Surely in the soil, you would be able to see that. So let's, let's get to that. In both years, differences in soil ammonium in and nitrate nitrogen due to nitrogen source were rarely found. I mean, second sentence or first sentence of, of a results of this. Rarely did they ever find any differences, which is what the same, the same paper we went over a week or two ago, they found the same thing. Sometimes it was greater with um, urea. Sometimes it was greater with um, um, uh, a nitrogen stabilizers. Most of the time, nothing happened. And that's what she's saying right here. Rarely did they find any differences. Extractable nitrate in and ammonium in from the sand soil showed few consistent differences due to nitrogen source. Although treatments fertilized with polyon sometimes had greater extractable nitrate in and ammonium in than measured in the unfertilized control table two. I'm going to read table two and then there's only one little thing here in the conclusions and then we're done. Now, this is what I want to point out in table two. And you're welcome to come pause the video and read through this if you want to or download the article and, and do it yourself. I've highlighted 
in green. Okay, what, for those who are well, I'm listening, I'm looking at table two, which is extractable nitrate and ammonium from the top three centimeters of soil in Auburn, Alabama in 2009. Excuse me. The top part here is the nitrate nitrogen. The bottom part is the ammonium nitrogen. And we have three, the three soils. We have the Sumter clay, we have the Marvin loamy sand, and then we have just a straight sand. So there's a lot of numbers on this graph, on this table. I've highlighted in green the occasions where UMAX resulted in the response that should have occurred. Okay. We have Days after application at the top, from set from one week all the way out to 10 weeks, and they're measuring soil nitrogen and nit soil ammonium from seven days, 14 days, 21 days, or all in one week intervals, all the way out to 70 days. You'll notice the green is very limited. There's one, two, three, four occasions out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times one two, three, that's 30. So 60, I guess there's roughly 60 opportunities here for UMAX to result in less nitrate, um, yeah, less nitrate and or more ammonium. Or there's 30 times for less nitrate and there's 30 times for more ammonium. That's what should have happened. Remember, UMAX is intended to hold it in the ammonium phase, reduce the nitrate, uh, quantity to reduce that availability to be able to be leached and so forth. So let's see what happened. 35 days and 42 days after, after application in the loamy sand, we saw that indeed UMAX resulted in less nitrate nitrogen than urea. It was three parts per million compared to urea at 4.5 parts per million. At, at the week later, same thing, 5.7 parts per million. When you use urea, it was 6.6 .6 parts per million. So in that case, there was a reduction in nitrate. When we go down to the sand, there were two occasions as well in sand. We went from 1.3 using UMAX. If you didn't use UMAX, it was 2.2 .2 parts per million of nitrate. And then way out here at 63 days, there was 1.3 going up to 1.8 when you used UMAX versus using urea. So those four occasions are when we saw a uh, result that we should have predicted. I mean, we would predict that to occur if indeed the product performs as claimed. Okay. However, let's look at what happens when we look at the whole picture, okay? There's two occasions where the opposite happens, where UMAX resulted in more nitrate nitrogen than urea. That happened at 56 days in the clay soil. It went from 9.6 using urea parts per million to 12.5 parts per million using UMAX. And then out here at 70 days, we see 4.9 parts per million nitrate nitrogen using urea up to 6.8 using UMAX. So there was an increase. There shouldn't be an increase. So let's just look at this thing. Whole, and then in the ammonium form, we saw absolutely nothing. So if you see all these UMAX and urea here, there's all these are A's and A's and A's and A's. No differences in the clay. There's no differences in the loamy sand. And there's no differences in the sand. All these are equivalent. So there was no effect uh, by you applying UMAX in terms of uh, increasing the quantity of ammonium, holding the nitrogen in the ammonium phase. Did not occur, at least when, from the two molar KCL extraction. We didn't, they, weren't, they didn't detect that at all. The nitrogen, the equal amounts of ammonium were found from urea as it was from ammonium, or from UMAX, okay? So it looks like the whole picture. We have two cases where UMAX resulted in the opposite of what should have happened. Out of, what did I say, 30? One, or, yeah, or one, two, three, four, five, whatever, whatever the numbers is. We did, they, did one, they did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then 12. So 100, oh, I was wrong, 100, 120. Is that right? 120? What, no, no, no. This would be one, two, three. So, so 30. So 30 opportunities. Two of those 30 opportunities resulted in the opposite effect. Four of those opportunities resulted in the desired effect. And then the other, you know, 24, nothing happened, or 22, whatever the number, had nothing happened. And nothing happened out of the 30 occasions that we, for an opportunity to see something happen with ammonium. So we're talking about a, a tremendous amount of, of data that shows 
nothing's probably going to happen. And even if it does happen, you know, sometimes it was desired result. Sometimes it held nitrate uh, uh, back. Other times it increased nitrate. So how are you going to know? How are you going to be able to make a prediction with any confidence that you're actually going to see something, a, a predictable outcome? It's probably not going to happen. And with ammonium, it didn't happen at all. Okay. At some point, you got to start asking. It's like, when, 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 when does the whole like uh, false advertising law start kicking in? <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. I mean, how much data, how much evidence do you actually need before you go? Well, hold on. There's where are you getting this stuff from? Because when you run the numbers, you don't see it, but they just keep selling it, keep producing it, and people keep buying it. You know, it's 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 sad. We get to the conclusions, and then this is it. Application of urea, of a urea source that contained a nitrification inhibitor, did not appreciably reduce total nitrate nitrogen or ammonium in leachate as compared to that measured in plots fertilizer with urea. It's just that simple, folks. If applied at a recommended rate to establish turf grass, leaching of nitrate nitrogen, ammonium nitrogen, and urea did not present an environmental hazard and use of any slow-release nitrogen source often further reduced nit nitrogen loss in leachate. So if we can sum this whole thing up, they were in Alabama, they're looking at Tifway Bermuda grass. They had three different soils and, and they, they use urea, a nitrogen, nitrogen stabilized UMAX ure, with urea and a polymer coated urea. They looked at nitrate leaching, they looked at ammonium leaching, they looked at urea leaching, they looked at ammonium and nitrate in the soil. And when you're looking at strictly between UMAX and, and urea, they basically found there was no, they didn't basically found, they, they, they concluded that the nitrification inhibitor didn't provide any value at all, really. The value that did occur came from the polymer coated urea. I mean, if you're going to buy into slow release materials, that's pretty consistent in the literature that those slow release materials are going to reduce these potential environmental losses. Okay. So that's the summation of that, that paper. And I got done in an hour. So I have one more thing I wanted to go over, but I'm going to hold back because it's just too much. I can't, I don't have enough time to go into it tonight. And I'm, I'm going to, if I get into it, it's going to be, it's going to be a mess. Um, anything else in the chat? This is the last time we're going to go over nitrogen stabilized, nitrogen stabilizers for a while. Okay. Tomorrow night, I'm sorry, tomorrow afternoon. Don't forget. I have a one o'clock show. So I'll post the, 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 uh, the, the episode tomorrow morning. It'll start at 1 PM Eastern time. I have a guest who I uh, believe, probably, probably wrong, but the best of my knowledge, he's the most cited turf grass author in the United States, according to Google Scholar. He's going to come on. We're going to talk about foliar applications. We're going to talk about how rapidly the, the turf grass can actually take up that nitrogen, how much nitrogen that the turf grass can actually take up from a foliar application, and probably you know infer a little bit from there like at what point after that application would it be safe to apply irrigation okay that's what we're going to be going over tomorrow at one o'clock anything else before i go shaddix okay let's look Sh uh, so gardener earth guy says shaddix's videos have shown to reduce the need for fertilizer applications allowing fertilizer budgets to be converted into bass boats and other toys well if you have a bass boat you can come on over to Lexington, Kentucky and pick me up. <laughs> I'm teaching my kids how to fish the last, um, this last summer and they got a kick out of it. So you, you, anybody, I, and I told my son, I said, I'm teaching him, you know, the ways of girls as, as if I know, I said this, anytime a girl comes up to you and says the following, you always say yes. And that is, Hey, um, can you take me fishing? You always say yes. I don't care who it is. <laughs> I don't care if you like the girl, you don't like the girl. If she asks you to go fishing, say yes <laughs> and go. That's a, my, my, uh, my uh, life lesson for my son on that day. And is there anything else? No ROI. Bird Lonker says no, no return on investment. Yeah. 
thanks Western Mass Turf for the email. I'll look that up. I don't know anything about that. I can't remember, even remember the name of the product you mentioned earlier. I don't don't remember what that is, but I I don't I don't recall coming across it. I'll look it up and see if there's anything anything there. I'll close this off with a little little music, and I'll be back tomorrow at one o'clock. All right, guys, I really appreciate everybody showing up tonight. As always, be kind. See you tomorrow.